Good evening and welcome to Prairie Lights. I'm Kathleen Johnson, the events coordinator here, and tonight I am very pleased to welcome Bisbee Nissen back to Iowa City with her husband, Jay Baron Nicorbo, who I am very pleased to welcome to Iowa City um, and to Prairie Lights to read from their new novels. Um, and this is just one stop on their Our La Lady of the Prairie Standard Grand Tour <laughs> which began January 24th in Newton, Massachusetts, and will conclude in San Diego on March 7th with hopefully some breaks in there, um, <laughs> because they have their their youngest member of the family, well, their son, joining them. Um, they'll be visiting some great independent bookstores, and we're honored to be part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start with uh, Jay. Um, Jay Baron Nicorvo will read from The Standard Grand. This, his first novel, has been picked for IndieBound's Indie Next list, Library Journal's Spring 2017 debut novels, Great First Acts, and was named a Best Book of the Year by the Brooklyn Rail. He has also published a poetry collection, Deadbeat, and his nonfiction can be found in Best American Essays, Salon, The Baffler, The Iowa Review, and The Believer. His writing's been featured on NPR and PBS NewsHour, He's an editor at Pan America and at Plowshares. Um, he spent years as membership director of the community of literary magazines and presses. And I found some additional information about him on his website that I thought would be um, fun, fun to add. Um, <laughs> he's, he's taught at Eckerd College, Emerson College, and Western Michigan University. But he's also stocked toilet pa the toilet paper aisle of Winn Dixie, <laughs> so you know he's got his spatial skills and his, his design technique, probably, uh, display design. Um, clerked at a drugstore, solicited donations for the Florida Police Athletic League, and waited tables at fondue restaurants, steakhouses, and French bistros. This B. Nissen, some of you may know, is a Writer's Workshop graduate, and so it is particularly special to have her back here in Iowa City and at Prairie Lights. She's the author of the novels The Good People of New York and Osprey Island, and a story collection, Out of the Girls' Room and Into the Night. She's also the co-author of The Ex-Boyfriend Cookbook, a collection of stories, recipes, and art collages. Uh, her writing has been published in the Iowa Review, The American Scholar, Story 17, Virginia Quarterly Review, Story Quarterly, Glimmer Train, Vogue, Glamour, and The Believer, and is featured in several anthologies. Uh, Thisbe has taught at Columbia University, the Iowa Writers Workshop, Brandeis University, the New Schools, Eugene Lane College, and in the Low Residency MFA program at Pacific University. She's an associate professor of English at Western Michigan University. Liz B. Nissen and Jay Baron Nicorvo are parents yes. to two old cats, hopefully still. Um, oh, no, two young yes. cats oh, now. Two, <laughs> two young understudy cats, uh, many sprightly chickens, and one intriguing human child. They dream one day of raising goats which is a dream I think a lot of us can relate to. <laughs> We're very happy to have them here tonight. Please welcome She's first, Jay yeah. Baron Nicorvo. Thank you to Kathleen. Thank you, Prairie Lights. Thank you for coming out. Since we're in kind of creative writing capital of He's here in the United States. I thought I'd, I'd offer as an intro uh, a little excerpt from a, an essay on craft. And the essay is a little bit personal, um, but it also, too, offers an introduction to the novel. So I'll start for a moment with uh, the facts, and, and then we'll, we'll launch into the fiction. Uh, I think I'll read all told for a dozen minutes, and then I'll invite this be in. My former sister-in-law, deployed to Iraq in 2008 as part of the surge. Her MOS, Military Occupational Specialty, was 88M, Motor Transport Operator. She drove trucks, one of the most dangerous jobs in the Army. About halfway through her difficult deployment, my brother got word she was having an affair with another soldier. 
After 15 months, her tour ended and she returned stateside. Stationed a couple thousand miles from my brother, she cut off all communication. None of us could reach her, emailing, calling, texting. We had no idea what had become of her. In that absence of information, while my brother went out of his mind with grief and confusion, I did what writers do. I went into my mind. I worked to imagine what could have happened, and I did so partly out of a sense of guilt. I did not love my sister-in-law. I didn't even like her much. I tolerated her because my brother loved her. It's sad, shameful, really, but I found it's my lot. I fail as a person. I'm awkward, anxious, and angry in my dealings with family, friends, and strangers. In the face of my social shortcomings, which are legion, I try, after the fact, to write them by rewriting them. Sometimes I find my way toward empathy. Occasionally, when I write long and hard enough, running myself through the full ringer of human emotions, I reach something that approximates love. While my brother's marriage gradually dissolved, I spent the next five years in daily communion with a make-believe woman inspired by my sister-in-law. In the early going, she, the main character of my first novel, bore a resemblance, at least on the surface, to my sister-in-law. But the longer I spent with her, the more she asserted herself, becoming individual. Divorced from me and my preconceptions, and sharing only a few cursory details, a military job, a home state, with the woman who spurred her into being, she assumes a selfhood. She takes on a name, Specialist Antebellum Smith, and a roster of nicknames, Bellum, Ant, Bang Bang. She has a dog and a dirty mouth. With every nuance, with every telltale detail, she comes more lovingly to life. But what is love to a novelist? In Diane Ackerman's A Natural History of Love, she tells us, quote, <coughs> when I set a glass prism on a windowsill and allow the sun to flood through it, a spectrum of colors dances on the floor. What we call white is a rainbow of colored rays packed into a small space. The prism sets them free. Love is the white light of emotion." End quote. When we love someone, what we feel for this person is the full range of affect. This, according to Ackerman, is love. Love is not an emotion. Love is all emotion. And there, there aren't all that many. The dominant theory holds that there are merely six basics. Anger, disgust, fear, happiness, sadness, surprise. When I'm trying to create a major character, when I'm attempting to evoke in myself through the thought, action, and talk of that character, every last one of those six emotions I'm trying to evoke. When I ultimately do, if I do, I come to love her. This is my consolation, love, life-giving breath. And if I do love her, dear reader or listener, then maybe you will too. So now I'll introduce you to Antebellum Smith, or rather, I'll read from her point of view. Um, the novel is a bit big. Um, I think there are over a dozen point of view characters. One of them is a cougar. They span sort of gender and generation. Um, 
but I'll just stick to Antebellum Smith because we only have a limit, limited amount of time. Uh, the novel concerns Bellum Smith, Specialist Smith. She goes AWOL instead of going to the Middle East for the third time. She's deployed for a third time and she can't go. So instead she leaves her base and she winds up sleeping in Central Park in New York. There she meets a Vietnam vet who has in inherited a tumble down Borscht Belt resort from his wife. And this vet, this Vietnam vet, has converted that resort into a halfway house for homeless Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans. Uh, there's also a Houston-based multinational corporation that wants to buy the Standard Grand because it sits over the Marcellus Shale Formation. Specialist Smith gunned the gas and popped the clutch in the early Ozark morning. Her Dodge pickup yelped, slid to one side in the blue dark, then shot fishtailing forward. The rear tires burned a loud 10 meters of smoking, skunky rubber out front of the stucco ranch house on Title Road. She felt thankful for her bad marriage. It allowed her the privilege of living off base. She could go AWOL without having to bust the gates of Fort Leonard Wood. Her four barrel pocket pepper box, the COP 357, holstered, unloaded, rode on the passenger seat. To be sure she was doing right, she drove by Big Papa's Cabaret, a soda pop strip club that entertained lonely soldiers and unruly locals. Half a dozen men loitered outside, swigging from bottle-shaped brown bags. Sure enough, Travis's rusted out rice burner pickup still sat in the dirt lot, its browning buckmark decal in stars and stripes peeling from the rear windshield, a display of American pride on his Japanese truck. Unemployed, entrepreneurial Travis, inside somewhere, waited for the final lap dance to grind to a halt. Then his business got busy, Bill had happy hour. Smith could practically hear the last hurrah clapping and thigh slapping, the hands of the soldiers not always paired. The dented steel door swung open and out staggered the pokes. There was Travis, a townie bringing up the rear. Travis Harmon Wallace, her civilian husband. Overweight Travis. Travis under the influence of Lord knew what Travis. Shipless, automatic transmission Travis. He got blown back a step by the sunrise, shielding his eyes. He regained himself and made way to the milling men. She gave a long thought to killing him, Travis. The powerful Derringer on the pa passenger seat was a gift from him. He tried so miserably hard to be hard. A gun he thought sexy in her grip and gangsta in his. What he'd bought them for their last anniversary, his and hers concealed carries. Had them engraved, I'm your huckle bearer. When she tried telling him it was huckle Barry. He got in her face, near pistol whipped her with a present. The idea of loading the gun raised a cloud of bile into her tight chest. On her way out of town, she drove back by the house, its sham mortgage they'd started falling behind on the day after their incomprehensible closing. She slowed, tried to hear Foxtrot pawing at the door frame, nothing, likely asleep under the butcher block. She admired the twin tire marks she'd made earlier. They would be her lasting goodbye to Devil's Elbow, where every street name started with T. Steering clear of 66, she took title to Teardrop. Smith, keeping to country roads, channeled her daddy's crass drawl. Answer Bellum, he said in her head. You ever find yourself on the lamb? You shun pike it, you hear me, girl? Shun pike, Daddy? Shun the turnpike, dumbass. Bumpkin County Sheriff's a hell of a lot easier to outrun and revved up state troopers. I should know. She sped east out of the hot damn Ozarks through the Mark Twain National Forest. She threw her ringing phone, Travi, out the rear window into the parched summer. It smithereened in her rear view. She used her teeth to pull off her wedding band and engagement ring spat them into her hand, 
and shove them into the trash crammed ashtray. Ball bought diamond solitaire be damned. With each mile, it got harder to turn back. Smith had done it, quick and simple, absent without leave. She'd missed the dog most, was already wondering why she didn't drag him along. Foxy T would make for good company and decent protection, not as good or as responsive as her M4 carbine, but for damn sure warmer. This was simpler, alone. This was necessary. She had no girlfriends to talk her out of taking off. A tomboy raised by a hooligan single father. A dog person drawn to the doggy company of men. This disposition lent her, lent her advantage over the catty army women. Done two tours driving mostly men. Two tours more than most Americans. On her first, reassigned to Charlie Company, 321st Engineer Battalion, she made fuel runs. Al-Assad to Camp Ramadi, right after Alpha Freesboro, then K-Crossing up to Mosul. More than once during that first tour, she'd been on MSR Tampa, behind the wheel of a het, hauling sand imported to the desert. Local sand was too fine for concrete. Sand everywhere and not a single grain to mix. Had to transport sand from UAE to make a blast wall for fuck's sake as if sand were a form of government and what the Iraqis had at home just would not do. In Afghanistan, tour number two, assigned to the support battalion level moving cargo to P1 units, it was a lot of Ghazni to Bagram Airfield and back. Got so she sometimes forgot where in BFE she was, Iraq or Afghanistan, engaging urban ex-Bathists or rural Taliban with terrible teeth hearing Arabic or Pashto. The Hindu Kush mountains in the distance helped get her bearings. Most of Iraq was flat as Florida. On both tours, she saw a good bit of checkpoint detail. As a woman, she got to pat down women and kids. She'd been reassigned and set to deploy once more, third time's a charm. Two turns playing grab ass with circumcised women in burqas, driving disposable half million dollar trucks on those clusterfuck roads getting two kilometers per gallon of diesel, having had her unfair share of wrecks. She couldn't stomach risking her life yet again. She didn't want to drive, the one thing she was good at. Didn't even realize it was the driving till she got back stateside over a year ago, and a quick giddy up to the grocery store sent her into a long-winded panic. Spent a panting lifetime picking out a pre-wrapped head of iceberg lettuce from the pyramid of identical heads only to leave it in a magazine rack before bolting the checkout line with what felt like a heart attack. Didn't even like iceberg lettuce. Diagnosed her with PTSD, big surprise, who wasn't? Prescribed her Ativan for her anxiety, Respiradol to calm her, plus an antidepressant. Mix her a prescription cocktail and send her on her hazy, libidoless way. That was their idea of maintaining troop morale. U.S. military become a pharmacological force. Soon, soldiers would be wearing Pfizer patches on their uniforms. It made sense. It'd been grass and junk in the jungle, allowed, if not approved, and a generation later, designer pharmaceuticals had been sanctioned for the sandbox, where the recreational drugs of choice were the domestic hash in cubes like beef bouillon, easing you down off all the imported caffeine and methamphetamine cans of Red Bull more important to the surge than mortar rounds. Once her scripts kicked in, she'd lost a year and a half. Little idea where it went. Here she was, ready to redeploy, just like that. Medicated, she felt as though her life had been pirated and broadcast over the internet without her permission. At a crappy connection rate, on an ancient computer, audio muffled, video pixelated and herky-jerky. Her old life, high definition, painfully vivid, sexually driven, was available if she wanted to pay admission. The price was her post-traumatic stress. As she sped along, doing 75 and a 55, half wanting to get busted and turn back, the degrading voice of her cracker-ass daddy was replaced by the calm monotone of her shrink, 
Major Olmstead. You internalize the war, Smith. Attune yourself to the tensions and stresses of grave danger. Doesn't make you dysfunctional. Makes you a good soldier. But Olmstead's aim had been to ready her for a return to a drawdown war, forever flaring up. In addition to his scripts, he kept giving her re reading assignments, self-help books with embarrassing titles. An advocate for the power of positive thinking, he said the simple act of reading was an exercise in creative visualization. She instead engaged in destructive visualization, daydreaming ways to kill Travis. Then there was a scene, one she thought unrelated to her husband, she evoked over and over. She's in the heart of the Islamic world, infidelly. When she confused, when she confessed the fantasy to Major Olmstead, he suggested she imagined doing something constructive there, something helpful. She said it was helpful cussing Muhammad in Mecca, helped put her to sleep. But honesty, her honesty, earned her another ridiculous reading assignment. <coughs> That's when she started plopping her daily dose in the toilet, birth control and all. Sure enough, back came her bad case of the war jitters with a sudden sound of Travis yelling her name about bounced her out of her boots. But her desire also came roaring round the bend, and she felt a little bit like her daddy's reconditioned 70 American Motors Rebel machine, the V8 engine with its four-barrel motorcraft carburetor. Smith gave a thought to visiting the old bastard of a biker. All his warlock, warlock buddies called him Crease, wasting away with wife number five along a rural length of the I-4 corridor. She hadn't seen him since she shipped out for boot camp. She'd rather hang herself with a rusty length of concertina wire. Instead of turning south, she could head north toward Canada, seek asylum. She'd have to steal across the border. All she brought was her driver's license and military ID. Thank you. Now I will invite up Fizzy Nissen.